Now, every Monday here on Moneyline, we take a look at investing. This evening, we're looking at how to avoid making bad investments with a focus on Ponzi or pyramid schemes. Technically, a Ponzi scheme is a fraudulent investment operation where the operator, the individual or organization pays returns to his investors from new capital paid to the operator by new investors rather than from profit earned by the operator. Joining me for this discussion is Levin Gopal. He's with Merchant Africa. Levin, thanks so much for your time today. Hi. I've given quite a technical definition of what a Ponzi scheme is, but in layman terms, could you just give us a concrete example? With a Ponzi scheme, the, um, the pioneer would pay out exorbitant returns much higher than the marketplace offers. He'd pay either high interest rates or a promise of a fixed rand amount and this is uh, the scheme operates by new investors plowing money into it. He uses their capital to pay out the first set of investors. It's been with us in many forms over the years and a number of uh, shrewd operators have applied these schemes and really duped the general public. The mm. carrot, if you will, is the fact that there is this high return. So a number of South Africans are new to the investments world. And because they're unaware of where the benchmark is or what the norm is, a promise of 25% per month appeals You're to gonna people. You're going to go for that. They, they think yeah. this is great. Yeah. Um, it, it actually makes genuine investment models look very uh, meek. And so they look at the banks and they're, they're sold the scheme saying that other investment models uh, pipe out a huge amount of commission, um, they're uh, making a profit on your money, and we're able to do this because uh, we have superior investment knowledge or skill. Yeah. Uh, and there's usually uh, some underlying business associated with it. So you'd get the pure interest model. Some of these schemes involve a variety of products. So they may sell cosmetics to you as a front for the Ponzi scheme. Yeah. And then you're encouraged to pay in uh, a 10,000 rand joining fee and then bring in other investors and okay. then get a huge commission out so, of it. So what are the telltale signs, you know, because obviously we always told if something um, seems too good to be true, then it probably is. But what should people look out for? The first, uh, of course, if the interest rate or the return seems very attractive, I would recommend that people seek the advice of uh, registered financial uh, services uh, provider. So you'd, you'd speak to a stockbroker, an insurance advisor, uh, an accountant, just to confirm that these returns uh, are, are possible. Okay. So that's, I, I would believe, your first port of call. Speak to somebody that has authority on money matters and use that as a reference point, simply because Joe Public does not know what is too good to be true, unfortunately. Yeah. Now, what are the chances one does get their money back? I mean, you, you described a scenario where um, the first few investors would get some money in. I assume that's to reel in more people. Because if I come to you and say, they've paid me, they gave me my 25%, you are going to be enticed to then come on board. But what are the chances if you are 10 or 20 or 30 down the line that you'll get your money back? So it is generally a case that the, um, the first few will be paid out. Uh, that's used as an example uh, to show others that the scheme is true. People will show you uh, pictures of checks that they've received or bank statements uh, reflecting a big deposit. Yeah. And that's confirmation to try and pull people into the scheme. Very often, the operators have great uh, uh, methods of hiding these funds. Very sophisticated plans are put in place. And so in some instances, the funds are even piped to foreign bank accounts or uh, disappears locally. The authorities yeah. have struggled to find these funds. Yeah. In many cases, uh, you've seen criminal charges uh, and a variety of, of uh, legal issues springing out of this. But when the chase uh, is on for the money, uh, they're not able to always find uh, the bulk of it. Yeah. These schemes have taken different formats. It's been sometimes property investments. It's been related stock market investments, high interest rate schemes. Yeah. And the going rate in terms of interest in South Africa 
would be in the order of 6%. Yeah. If someone is offering you a few points above that, it could be acceptable. But some of these schemes go up to 20 or 30% per annum. In some cases, as much as 20 or 25% per month. Uh, and I would caution people to uh, to investigate these uh, Ponzi schemes or, or these returns and find out how, how they're able to pay. How they're actually able to pay. All right, we'll leave it there. Thanks for your time. Levan Gopal is with Merchant Africa. Now, Nigeria's economy is going from bad to worse. Its currency, the Naira, endured its worst week ever in history, depreciating to 190.36 Naira to the U.S. dollar. This despite interventions by the central bank. Nigeria's currency, the Naira, has been taking a beating since the last quarter of 2014. As plummeting oil prices continue to thump the country's economy. The Naira closed off last week, depreciating to 190.36 Naira to the US dollar on Friday, and also traded between 200 and 201 Naira at the interbank market. This is the worst monthly drop in almost six years against the dollar. According to the Nigerian Stock Exchange, the pain is being felt by investors too. It says the index was dragged back by mostly large cap stocks, which saw significant price losses during the week. With Nigerian stocks notoriously recording the worst week for global exchanges. The top stock losers for the week include Brewery Guinness saw a negative 22.56% change, opening at 168 Naira and closing at 130.21 Naira. Dangota Cement opened at 200 Naira and closed at 158.65 Naira, a negative 20.68% change. Axis Bank saw negative 20.45% change, opening at 6 Naira and closing at 5.35 Naira. But some analysts say there is hope for the Nigerian currency with the death of King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia, which is the biggest producer in OPEC. Speculation is rife that all prices may rebound and mean a turnaround for the Naira. Dorozo Kumalo, Johannesburg. Now, the South African solar energy industry is on its knees and getting ready to let go of some 6,000 jobs. A technical regulation by the Department of Trade and Industry introduced in 2012 has been blamed for crippling the industry. The alleged red tape deals with the percentage of local content required in the manufacture and procurement of low-pressure solar water heaters. Industry um, heads say in the past 18 months, more than 30,000 units have been gathering dust at suspended factories. The regulation disqualifies 9 out of 10 manufacturers of low-pressure solar water heaters. To help us unpack this, we're joined by James Green, who is with the Sustainable Energy Society of Southern Africa. James, thanks so much for your time uh, this evening. evening. Some background. What is this all about? Well, it's quite a long story, but basically the president back in 2010 launched the National Solar Water Heating Program, and a target of 1 million solar water heaters was born with the intention that those would be installed by March in about two months' time. Uh, currently, the level of solar water heaters that have been installed is around 400,000 in total. And at the end of 2010, basically, there was a big push into a socioeconomic uplift program. Uh, and some 300,000 what are referred to as low-pressure solar water heaters were installed free of charge to uh, RDP homes around yeah. the country. Uh, that program ended on the 31st of December 2012 with the intention that it was going to be replaced by a sort of contract tender route. And in the previous two years, um, the industry had been advised of government's desire for uh, a local content preference. And a whole number of factories set up. Uh, and we're manufacturing low-pressure solar water heaters, locally made, with an overall local content of around 75 to 80 percent. Okay. And then what happened, uh, the industry stalled at the end of 2012, and then in um, June, uh, sorry, July uh, 2013, a rule was brought out by the DTI which specified two specific components within the solar water heater, yeah. which disqualified nine out of the ten 
existing manufacturers. Okay. And the, what sorry. is this, what are the implications of this rule? Because I want to get to how we end up with job losses and okay. units sitting well, gathering dust. The consequence of the disqualification was that no solar water heaters have been installed. And when government put the policy out, a lot of SMMEs set up around the country yeah. uh, to install solar water heaters. And as a result of the market literally stopping dead, around 6,000 jobs have been lost since the end of 2012. And that is the situation which prevails today. Okay. And currently the slight impasse in terms of the negotiations which the industry has had with the DTI to try and resolve the situation has not been resolved and those 6,000 people are still out of business. Can we, can we manufacture these, um, the, the, local, the, the element of the local content that the government wants in South Africa? What is the situation? Well, it's slightly complicated. Um, perhaps the easiest way of looking at it, government set an overall directive of having 70% overall local content. Yeah. And if you were, for example, cooking a cake and you were looking at a recipe, you could take all the ingredients and say we can have 70% of the whole on value on local content. But they didn't do that. What they effectively did was to take two slices of cake, which could be different sizes, and mm. say they want 70% of each of those slices, which makes it much more complicated. But there is one component which is imported from China, which is an evacuated tube, which cannot be manufactured in South Africa currently, and there's nobody invested in to do it. And that is where the problem has come. All of those manufacturers use those tubes which were imported from China, which represents about 20% of the total. Goodness. Okay. We'll have to leave it there. We're out of time, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks. James Green is with the Sustainable Energy Society of Southern Africa. Our daily question and answer feature is up next. Stay with us.